a new sermon series now called uh, Kingdom Coming, looking at the advance of God's kingdom in this earth and uh, the privileged part we get to play in it. And uh, if the series is called uh, Kingdom Coming, my talk today is called Kingdom Calling. I think there are few topics that Christians wrestle with more than the question of calling. Lord, what am I called to? What's the higher purpose in my life? What is that thing which when I step out and do it, I feel more passionate, I feel more alive, I feel more me than when I'm doing anything else? Lord, what is it that when I step out and do it, I sense your pleasure because I'm doing that for which you've made me? Have you ever wrestled with those sort of questions? And sometimes we wrestle because if we're honest, we haven't got a clue what the Lord wants us to do. But that's okay. I believe that by the end of tonight, you'll have more of a clue. <laughs> and sometimes we wrestle with these questions because actually we do have an inkling of what the Lord has for us, but maybe we don't feel adequate or well enough equipped for it. Or sometimes we can think of a number of things that we could do for God, but we're, we're sort of paralyzed by choice. Whatever you're wrestling with right now, the passage tonight is perfect for you. And um, actually, the Holy Spirit's been doing amazing things today. Uh, just even when this passage is being read, people are hearing the Lord, and they're being touched by the Holy Spirit afresh. And I'm expecting that as we read these words now, the Holy Spirit will begin to uh, flick a switch inside us, as it were, to, to reawaken us to all that God has for us. And uh, I believe earlier on in the service, somebody got up and just felt like the Lord leading them to um, uh, speak from some of the words from Isaiah 61, which is amazing, because we actually find uh, reference to verses from Isaiah 61 in the passage tonight. So it's Luke chapter four, beginning at verse 14. That's on page 1041. Luke four, verses 14 to 21. Here we go. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So Jesus goes into the synagogue in Nazareth where he grew up. And he reads from the scroll the verses from Isaiah 61 as a prophetic statement as to the purpose of his ministry and kingdom calling. And that calling was to usher in the kingdom of God, his kingdom. And the kingdom of God is still advancing on earth today. It's both now, but also not yet. It's not completely fulfilled and won't be until Christ returns. But his calling was to usher in the kingdom, to begin a reestablishing, that is, of God's rule and reign. 
Not in some sort of geopolitical sense, but in the hearts and minds of people. Now, you might say, okay, Miles, that's all well and good. Uh, I, I kind of get that. Uh, but what's that got to do with us? Well, it's no coincidence that Jesus uses words from Isaiah 61 to usher this in. Because the context of Isaiah 61 is homecoming. It's the people of God returning from exile. And as the kingdom advances today, at the heart of it, it's sons and daughters like you and me coming home to the Father through Jesus. And what's more, it takes on a new resonance in our own lives when we understand what I like to call the game changer in the Christian faith. See, in the New Testament, when talking about uh, those of us who have chosen to put our faith in Jesus, 86 times the New Testament uses this phrase, that we're now in Christ. Which means that somehow, mystically, mysteriously, whatever is true of Christ, whatever has happened to Christ, is now also true of you and me and has happened to you and me. In other words, this is not just Jesus standing there reading out the verses of Isaiah 61 as a prophetic statement over his own life's calling. That's also you and me in Christ standing there reading out those verses over our lives as a statement of our calling. In other words, if we want to know what's God's calling on our lives, we need look no further than these verses. Now, exactly how they are worked out in our lives will vary from person to person. And this is where we often tie ourselves up in knots, isn't it? We want to know the specifics of how it's gonna work out today or tomorrow or next week. But actually, I, I think that's, not the crux of it. You know, the bigger, the more fundamental, the more general points about calling is what God wants us to grasp and which are clear in this passage and which I'd like to pull out this evening. Three things. The first is this. Our calling is present, not future. So in verse 21, Jesus says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. We're never in the waiting room for our calling. If we're living in the future, we miss the God opportunities of today. It's today. If we kind of put it off and say, well, you know, when this happens, then I'll be able to do this. The problem there is when never comes and then never begins. It's today. You know, growing up, I loved the Winnie the Pooh stories. And especially the dialogue is it's genius, the way it's written. And I, and I always remember this little conversation between Pooh Bear and his friend Piglet. Winnie the Pooh turns to Piglet and says, what day is it? And Piglet goes, uh, I think it's today. <laughs> and Pooh Bear goes, oh good, my favorite. But the thing is, there is no other day in existence. It's always today. And Jesus says, today, this scripture is fulfilled. Our calling is now. And what's more, we read in verse 16 of Jesus. He went to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. In other words, Jesus is in a familiar place, doing a very familiar thing when he utters this prophetic statement as to his and our calling. God often calls us when we're in the familiar place, doing the familiar things. Maybe the familiarity of your home or the familiarity of your workplace or the familiarity of your school or college. This is where God speaks I wonder, where has God placed you right now? You're there for a reason. This is where he wants to speak to us. 
And we don't have to sort of, um, I don't know, think bizarre things that to try and step out of the box to hear God speak to us. No, this finite, this infinite God stepped into the finite box of this world as a baby to call us. Precisely so we don't have to try and break out of the box to receive the calling. You're in the right place. I believe that's true for most of us. The question is, however, what are we doing in that place? I, I don't know about you, but I know for me, you know, life is busy, isn't it? It's busy for all of us, especially in London. And I know that I can sort of blink and a week's gone by. And then I blink again and what, focus already? I mean, another year. But all the opportunities that the Lord has placed before me, and at times I just don't even notice they're there, or I grasp at them half-heartedly. But the calling is active, and it's now. It's not passive. This kingdom calling is not latent. It's now. Look at the verbs in Isaiah 61. Preach, proclaim, release. They're active. You know, Jesus elsewhere in Matthew's gospel actually says, the kingdom of God advances forcefully and forceful men and women lay hold of it. Every uh, Saturday, my youngest son is allowed a treat. And that treat is just on Saturday, he's allowed to play a children's game on the iPhone. And uh, last Saturday, he had been uh, particularly good. He'd saved up some of his pocket money and he'd done some extra chores. So we promised him that he could, uh, in this game, uh, buy some gemstones. These are sort of gemstones in the game that allows you to do really cool stuff. And the gemstones cost £1.49. So he, he, he got uh, my wife's phone and he came up to me last Saturday and reminded me that I'd said that he could have this. And I was doing the washing up at the time. So I took the phone, I put the code in, and where you buy the gems, I hit the button. Then I passed the phone back to him and turned to do the washing up. There was the error in my parenting, right there. <laughs> this is why Nikki and Silla lead, lead the parenting course, and I don't. Of course, I, I should have watched what he was doing, but I turned to do the washing up. Well, he walked around the corner and thought, Hmm. I wonder what happens if I hit the button again. Oh, more gems. Oh. They just they just keep coming. Now, of course, it was primarily my fault. I take responsibility for that, and when we found out, I did have words with him, and he was uh, exceedingly sorry. <laughs> but I, I did wonder afterwards, I wonder at what stage I would have thought, that's enough gems. <laughs> Maybe having hit the button 10 times? 12, perhaps? Not my son. In the course of just over three minutes, <laughs> he managed to spend 216 pounds. <laughs> You're gasping. <laughs> unbelievable. In fact, so unbelievable, thankfully, that the company have agreed to reimburse us the whole amount. <laughs> The kingdom of God advances forcefully. <laughs> and forceful men and women with strong fingers <laughs> lay hold of it. When, when the Lord places opportunities in front of us, he doesn't want us to sort of half have a go. He wants us to lay hold of it. Our calling is now. Don't defer your destiny. Lay hold of it. Secondly, 
Our calling is plural and not singular. This is not just about individuals being called to kingdom work. Together, we now make up the body of Christ. Of course, Jesus embodies all of the calling, and I, I think it's interesting that in, in Luke 4, after he's left the synagogue in Nazareth, he, the next three acts he then does are living out the verses of Isaiah 61 in exactly the same order. So the spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He leaves the synagogue in Nazareth. He goes to Capernaum and preaches good news to the poor. He's anointed me to uh, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, to release the oppressed. He then, after that, drives an evil spirit out of a man to bring complete freedom and restoration to him. And then he's anointed me to uh, bring about recovery of sight for the blind, in other words, healing. After that, he then goes to Simon's, Simon Peter's house and heals his mother-in-law. Jesus embodies this kingdom calling. And it may well be that each of us at different times in our lives are presented opportunities to go about bringing the kingdom in all these different ways. But please don't feel the pressure of you know, having to do all of it all of the time, every day. We don't have that pressure because together we make up the body. In other words, it's okay to work out what you are particularly passionate about in terms of the kingdom. And if you're here thinking, actually, I don't know what I'm passionate about, that's okay too. Because I I believe that God will call it out of you and he'll carve it out of you. What do I mean? Well, in verse 17, Jesus takes the scroll, he reads out uh, the verses from Isaiah 61, and then he says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And all throughout this week, I've been praying that as people hear these verses of scripture, indeed, the Holy Spirit would flick a switch, that you have this passion bubble up inside you, this sort of holy discontent building as you hear one facet of of this kingdom advancement, whether it's preaching good news to the poor, proclaiming freedom for the prisoners, setting the the oppressed free, uh, healing, year of the Lord's favor, a new start, forgiveness for people, whatever it is, I, I believe the Holy Spirit even now is gonna be quickening our spirits for some aspect of this calling. He calls it out of it, out of us. And, and let's not look with ordinary eyes, but with the eyes of faith as we look out. Don't call it like we see it, call it like God says it. And let it come out, let it stir. And what's more, God carves it out of us. Just take a look at this uh, picture, please. This is um, probably the most famous sculpture in the world. Uh, David, as in uh, David and Goliath. And um, this was sculpted, of course, by the genius Michelangelo, age 26. And uh, Michelangelo was asked, how were you able to sculpt such a, a, a beautiful David? And Michelangelo said this of David, I saw him in the marble and carved until I set him free. Jesus sees things in you and me that we, we simply don't see. He sees beautiful things in you and me. And by his grace, he begins to carve it out of us. Michelangelo also said of David, I chipped away all that was not David. And that's why when we begin to walk into these God-given passions in our life, we don't somehow become you know, another Christian clone lost in the body of Christ. And when, we, when we step out into these passions, we become more like the real us as he chips away all that is actually not you and me. And together, we make up the body of Christ to embody this kingdom calling. It's plural, 
not singular. And then thirdly, our calling is ultimately to a person and not a place. When I've wrestled with these questions of calling uh, over the years, it really, it boils down to three questions for me again and again. What, when, and where? But I've come to the conclusion that actually God isn't very interested in these three questions. He's far more interested in the questions who, why, and how. Our calling, of course, ultimately is to the person of Jesus. Our purpose is to ever grow more like him, to step out in his power, and to bring glory to him. How? Well, in verse 18, Jesus says this. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me. The word Christ means anointed one. And it has its roots in the Old Testament kings. They would be crowned and then they'd be anointed by the prophet. And Christians or Christians also means anointed ones. We are anointed. We have the spirit of Christ, the anointed one, the king of kings living in us. And the kingdom comes and advances when we change our thinking from I I need to find the person who carries the anointing to hold on, I am the person who carries the anointing. That is when the kingdom begins to advance in power. And last Sunday, we celebrated, didn't we? Uh, Pentecost Sunday, when we remember that first outpouring of the Spirit on all people. And we now live in the age of Pentecost. We have the power of the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is in you for your benefit, but he's also on you for the benefit of others. And when we go and we step out in the power of that Spirit, the purpose of it all is simply to point to Jesus. I love verse 20 after he's read the scroll. It says this of Jesus. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. Whatever we're doing, wherever we find ourselves, the purpose always is to point to Christ that other people's eyes might be fastened on him. It's all about him. Yesterday afternoon, I was in the car park just over there. Um, I don't normally hang out in the car park. There's not a lot going on. Um, But I was praying. I was praying, Lord, what do you really want me to say (laughs) about this? And I felt God say to me, just say that this whole question of calling is simple. But I then said, but Lord, it's not simple. (laughs) At which point, around the corner into the car park came a policewoman. Now, I don't know about you, but for some reason, whenever I see the police, I suddenly feel incredibly guilty. (laughs) And she she walked straight up to me. I thought, what have I done? (laughs) But then the conversation was completely unexpected. She said, hello. Obviously that bit wasn't unexpected, but (laughs) she, she said, hello. I went, hello. And then she said, are you at this church? And I said, uh, yes, I am. And then this is what she said. She said, oh, good. Please could you tell me about the Alpha Course and Jesus? really <laughs> and she said you wouldn't believe it she said I, 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 I often walk the beat around here and she said I don't know what's going on but over the last couple of weeks the last five people that I've stopped and really talked to have all said the same thing to me they have said oh you need to go to that church and do the Alpha course <laughs> I said well maybe somebody's trying to tell you something So we 
we talked about Alpha and then we got onto the person of Jesus. And then she said, you know what, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna come and do it. And then as she walked off, I said to God, okay God, you win. Because <laughs> he'd given me this enacted parable to try and get the point through. You know, there and then, that was my calling. I didn't have to go to any far-flung place. I was just standing in the car park. She came to me. I wasn't in it alone, carrying the burden. Actually, the, the other five people had done the really hard work. And then all I had to do was just point to Jesus. Our calling is simple, and it's now.